Okay, Al, you're up. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alfonso Santillan. I have the honor of presenting our guest speaker today. He is a Marine aviator, a Vietnam veteran, a teacher, a Hall of Famer, and our hometown hero. He has been decorated with the second highest award our country can give for heroism, the Navy Cross. He has also distinguished himself with the Legion of Merit and three distinguished flying crosses. Up and boom! It is my honor to present to you Colonel Fred L. Cohn, United States Marine Corps, retired. Sir. Thank you, Al. Thank you. At ease. Take your seats. Please. please. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you this afternoon. I would like to uh, talk about three things. I'll uh, entertain any questions you might have, and then we'll uh, go ahead and go from there. We'll probably only get through two of them in during this hour, because I think I would like to ask you some questions also on the, the things. The first thing I'd like to talk about is goals. Now, it's been said that everyone needs to have a goal. Because without a goal, you're just milling around. You're not doing anything. And so we need to talk about goals. And I'm going to tell you about the goals that I had at growing up and in the Marine Corps so that you can kind of get an idea of the flavor of the Corps, perhaps. Uh, I'm just a farm boy from Missouri. Grew up on a farm in northwest Missouri. Uh, lived there my entire life. Uh, as I was in high school. My father let me grow a tobacco crop my senior year in high school. And that was our cash crop in there. We grew uh, corn uh, and soybeans, hogs, and, and cattle. But for cash, we had tobacco. And tobacco in those days, this 19, early 1950s, uh, was about worth about $1,500 an acre, and our family had a five-acre base. So a little high-speed math here, five times 15 is about $7,500. To put it in perspective, a new Chevrolet uh, back then cost about $1,800, fully equipped. And so as a high school senior, if I had a good crop, I was going to earn about $7,500, which I'd mean about seven new Chevrolets. So I was feeling pretty good, you know. That was going to be something that I was going to really enjoy. Well, as it so happened, the crop became uh, mature and ready to be harvested the last week in August. And so I had what called topped it out, and on a Friday, I was getting ready to put it in the barn on. Monday morning, when that Friday night there was a hail storm came to northwest Missouri. Now, it wasn't a very big one, but it came right over our farm. And I got up the next morning, Saturday morning, and there was 50,000 tobacco stalks sticking straight up in the air, and all the leaves were on the ground. The crop was ruined. I had it insured for $300, and that paid my seed bill and my gas bill, my tractor bill for that year. Gas, gas wasn't expensive as it is today, about 20 cents a gallon. And so I had no money left. I went to my dad and he said, well, son, he says, uh, I haven't got anything for you to do, but uh, when you were in high school, uh, you took some tests and you got a scholarship. Why don't you go on to college? I had not taken those tests in the thinking about college. My goal was to be a farmer. That's what I wanted to be the rest of my life. But all at once, I had no crop, no money, and nothing to do. So I decided to go ahead and go to college. That was the last week in August. I got on a bus. My dad gave me uh, some money, uh, $20 to be a fact. I still remember it, and sent me to college. I rode that bus for three days from 
uh, St. Joseph, Missouri, where I got on, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and started to the University of New Mexico. I had a, a scholarship, we'll call it a Naval ROTC scholarship. You've heard of those, uh, the ROTCs in college, they have the Naval and the Air Force and the Army. Uh, they all give them, and you can take those tests when you're a senior uh, in high school. I had taken them, like I said, just to see how I do, not with the thought of ever going to college, but uh, you know, there was a bunch of us that took them. We all went down and had a good time taking the test, and, and several of us passed it, including myself. So I had a scholarship. I got off the bus in Albuquerque, New Mexico on a Monday, and by that, about seven o'clock in the morning, and it was really hot because the end of August, and uh, I, but at the end of the day, which was a very memorable day for me, I had a job. I worked a night crew in a motel as the clerk, and got my uh, room. Uh, I worked from six at night until six in the morning. And then I got registered for school, and, and I had a place to stay right there at the motel at night. So anyway, uh, I got to the school and the registrar said, well, what do you want to take, cowboy? I said, well, I'm a farmer. I want to take agriculture. She said, you don't teach it here. I said, you don't? Well, what do you teach? She said, well, we have an engineering course. I said, sign me up for that. The reason I tell you that story is that I didn't have a backup, one, for my occupation as being a farmer, and so I had to take what was just left over by going to school, and that was not a very good uh, thing to do, to leave everything to chance like that. And then when I got to school, uh, the thing I wanted to take was agriculture, and they didn't teach it. So I had no backup, so the first thing that she uh, recommended was engineering. I could add two and two and get four most of the time. I was not that good in math, but I was okay. And so I got signed up for engineering, and I was going to study that for the next four years. Well, I tell you those stories just in case, you know, sometimes your goals don't always work out. Although you may plan for them and really hope for them, so you always need a backup, no matter what you do. So always consider that. Well, I went to college. I uh, studied engineering. It was a lot of fun. Uh, there were only 12 in my class. Uh, so, you know, and, uh, we had a, a real good uh, group uh, to study. It wasn't like the universities they have now, where they have hundreds in a classroom and things like that. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And I worked my way through school. I had a, a of various jobs uh, besides the one at the motel, working the night trip, I did various things. I taught swimming down to the Y for one year. Uh, then I taught uh, with, with some of the school students. I taught uh, a modern term and, and, and did some tuition te teaching and things like that, tutoring, I should say, and came up to graduation. Now, this was in the mid-50s, and the Korean War was just over, but we had the draft. And in the draft, everybody went. So I said, well, you know what? Uh, I had taken ROTC in college. There was no ROTC in high school where I went to school. Uh, but I had taken it in college, and uh, I liked it. It was a lot of fun. And they offered a job. I had either the choice to make of either going in the, to the Naval Service and, and have a job there, or I could go ahead and go to, uh, and, and be drafted, and then take a choice. You know, generally everybody was drafted and went in the Army. Uh, at that time, there wasn't even an Air Force. That didn't come around until uh, actually uh, 47, wasn't it? Yes, sir. That's when we started there. So we didn't actually have uh, a lot of places to go. So I decided to go into the Marine Corps because I I'd had a cousin that was in the Marine Corps. And that was all I knew about. There had been nobody in my family that had ever been in the service. And so, uh, I'm in my immediate family. And so I was the first one to actually go in and I volunteered to go in the Marine Corps. I was going in as an infantry officer. I like to be outside 
I like to uh, uh, be with the troops and uh, camp out and uh, do things like that. And so I thought that would be a lot of fun. I could do that for four years. Uh, I got in and I was in the infantry and it, it was a good time. In the Marine Corps, they send you a thing called basic school as an officer candidate. And you're there for uh, my basic school because right after the Korean War was stretched out because they had nothing for us to do really, not to go to war, things like that. I was there for almost a year. Uh, and uh, now it's uh, considerably shortened because of the war and things like that. It's only half that much time. It was a, it's about five months now that they send you to the basic school. And at the basic school, you run the, run, uh, various programs, you learn a little bit about everything. Uh, they'll learn a little bit about tanks, about artillery, about infantry, about aviation, uh, about computers, uh, about uh, disciplinary things. Uh, it's just a, a good education for being an officer, and it's really uh, a lot of fun. You sit through a lot of classes, but you also have a lot of field work, and I enjoy the field work the most. And so that's the reason I decided to be an infantry officer. Well, I graduated from the basic school and I was down at Camp Lejeune with my platoon. And it was February. Now, Camp Lejeune is in North Carolina and you think, well, it's pretty warm. But I'll tell you what, Camp, Camp Lejeune in the wintertime on the coast can be one of the coldest places you've ever been. And it happened so happened that one day in February, it had been raining off and on all day. I had mud up to about here. I was cold and miserable. And there was a fellow that came to the field. And he had all these kind of funny coverall suits, kind of like the color color has got on here now. <laughs> so wrong. And, uh, yeah. I like it. And uh, uh, he had a, a cover on, and he was a Marine officer. And he says, you know, I've got an airplane down here at the air patch, and we need aviators. Uh, if any of you would like to become an aviator, uh, I'd like to take you out and give you a, uh, a test flight. Well, I had never been in an airplane, never even ridden in one as a, a passenger. I was 26 years old by that time. Yes. Here is this? Uh, 1957. And so anyway, uh, here I am, and I looked at him, and he was dry and he was pretty clean. I was soaked to the bone. I was muddy as, as could be, and so I volunteered. Now, in the service, you don't volunteer for too many things, but I kind of figured that this man was not going to put me in his airplane as dirty as I was, muddy and wet, and sure enough, they took me down, put me into one of those funny coveralls like the cat <laughs> and dried out, and uh, <coughs> put me in the back of, of an airplane called it S. In J. We used to kid, and the name called them SNJs. We called them Super Navy Jets. Now, it wasn't a jet at all. It was just like the airplanes we have out here at the airfield. Uh, there's a couple of them out there that were trainer airplanes. It was a four and a half trainer aircraft. And so he put me in the back of that airplane. And he got in the front and started it up. What was the, what was the name? Was it, was it a? SNJ. Like that? that? That's it, right there. That's just like it. that. We have one of them out here at the airfield, just, just like this. I was in the back, and he was in the front. He taxied out, and I didn't know. I saw a bunch of instruments there, and a stick between my legs, and, you know, there's a throttle, a, a throttle handle over here. I didn't know. And he took the airplane off, got the wheels in the well, and said, okay, Colin, you got it. I said, wait a minute. I don't know what to do. He said, oh, it's easy. He says, you just take that throttle stick and push forward. You go fast. You pull back. You go slow. You take the stick and you pull back and you go up, you push forward and you go down. I said, oh, okay. So for about a half an hour, he kind of guided me around and things like that. And I tell you this story because when I got down from that thing, I was so jazzed and I was so excited. I said, where's that paper? I want to sign up and do this right now. <laughs> and he had made me think that I was the greatest aviator since Charles Lindbergh. He made me think I was the ace of the base. He did a sales job on me that was, you know, really something. I was going to be the greatest uh, air pilot that the world had ever known. <laughs> Little did I know that six months later, when I got down to Pensacola, Florida, uh, and started 
flying for real and learning how to fly, that I wasn't the greatest aviator. I wasn't a second Charles Erdberg. I was just an average aviator. You know, I made uh, lots of mistakes. I did get something wrong, but I worked hard at it, and I finally got through. It took me about, uh, oh, about 11 months to get through flight school. And uh, I flew several airplanes, in, in, besides the SNJ, the T-28, and the SNB, and, and I flew the T-2s uh, as a jet. Uh, it, that was a, a brand new thing we had in flight training at that time, was the jets. We didn't have many of them. We only got a couple of orientation flights in them. We didn't really get to train in them much just to go, because most of us were still in reciprocating engine aircraft at that time. So anyway, I got through flight school and uh, was uh, headed out to my first duty station. I got to tell you a story about this because at that time there was a lot of green bases around. One of them was at a place called Opalaca, Florida, which is just north of Miami. As a matter of fact, Opalaca runways adjoin Miami International runways, and I was assigned to Opalaca, Florida. Boy, you, a happy guy, you know, I'm going to be in Florida, I'm going to be on, in Miami Beach, it's going to be great, and things like that. The week I was to report in, they closed Opalaca. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you've never seen a grown man cry, <laughs> that was one thing. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I got stationed in a place called Cherry Point, North Carolina. And by that time, I'd been in the service for, oh, a couple of years. I'd spent a year in the infantry, and then I'd spent a year in flight school, uh, getting my wings. And so I'd been in for a couple of years of my four-year tour. And it was, and I got married. I had just gotten married uh, and uh, to a lovely woman from North Carolina that I met up in Quantico when I was going to, through basic school up there. She was the choir director of the Baptist Church there. And I met her and, and, and married her, uh, love of my life. And really, it was uh, we were both disappointed because uh, she had relatives in Florida, so we were going to have a good time there. But we got to North Carolina, and I said, Mary, where is, is Cherry Point? She said, I don't know. I never heard of the place. As a matter of fact, here's the I got a picture of it here. So oh yeah, can, there, there, oh yeah, there's uh, Havelock, North Carolina. Out by the Outer Banks. Our, yeah, the Outer Banks here and things like that. And uh, so there is right Cherry Point right there. Now this is an old Air Force training field in World War II. As a matter of fact, it was a secondary base for the space shuttle to land if Cape Canaveral was that. And the reason being, it's got the longest runways besides Air. Edwards Air Force Base in the United States. Uh, the runways, there's a patch right here, and that is a thousand foot square. There are four runways coming off that they use for training. Each one of them is 8,500 feet. So a little high speed math, I'll say 8,500 feet, 8,500 feet, 17,000. And then you got a thousand foot in here, which is 18,500 foot runway. So that could take the space shuttle. And so it was an alternate base for the space shuttle uh, if Cape Canaveral was ever closed. They never did use it, but that and it still is. Um, interesting thing about this space, I'll just digress a little bit about my training. Being the longest runways in the world, they have F-8 Crusaders stationed there. Now, I never did get to fly the F-8 Crusader, but it was the only airplane in the service, well, as far as I know, in the world, that had a variable pitch wing. Now that's a fancy term said, the wing could go up and down. If it was a supersonic fighter, uh, and, and you're going real fast, the wing's down to make it supersonic. But when you want to land, you, the wing would come up and you could go ahead and land the airplane at a reasonable speed, it was around 140 knots. But if you couldn't get that wing up so that you land at 140 knots, which is about 155 miles an hour. Then you had to land it at about 210 knots, which is about 225 miles an hour. And that's pretty fast. There's the F-8, it looks like, and I don't see a picture of it with the swing up, but with the wing would come up here. Oh, there it is. There's a picture of it. With the wing would come up like that for it to land, and then it would go down 
for it to fly fast. And so when the wind wouldn't come up, something broke or something like that, they'd have to land it at 225 miles an hour, and that's pretty fast. So they yeed that whole runway, that whole 18,500 feet. Wow, that's really huge. So over three miles of runway. The only other runway I know uh, in the United States States was at Edwards, and then of course Hickam. Remember sure. Hickam? Sure. Hickam used to have they that long them. runway. Uh, they cut it in two and made half of it civilian, half of it military. I think that is amazing. But uh, that was the place that they had the, the airplane, and so they use that, and then you land on one end, they go and they say, "We're going to take the jog," you know, and they take the jog and roll out on that eighteen thousand five hundred foot runway if they couldn't get the wing. Up. Well, that was digressing from my training. My training, <laughs> I got to tell you about it because uh, the Marine Corps does it a little bit different than the Air Force. Now, let me brag on the Air Force just a minute. Can I, Colonel? <laughs> just occasionally. Okay. <laughs> In the Air Force, the Air Force is pretty strict, and they teach you how to fly one airplane. And they keep you in that airplane, not forever, but they don't let you go around too much, and there's a reason for it, and the reason is safety. Because as you fly an airplane, and I have a lot of Air Force uh, friends that were pilots, those people could fly their airplane forever. They knew everything about that airplane. They could field strip that airplane at the midnight in the middle of a driving rainstorm, put it back together and fly it off and do all kinds of things with it, and they were really good. <coughs> in the Marine Corps, it was a little bit different. They let you fly anything you want. And that's a lot of fun, you know? But it wasn't too safe. As a matter of fact, we in the Marine Corps, not to brag about it, but just to state a fact, we had the worst safety record going. <laughs> I had a lot of friends that got killed. And I can still remember being in a squadron. We had five different airplanes in it and current all five. And I'd get in one airplane in the morning and fly it, and get in another airplane, different airplane in the afternoon, and I'd say, I know this airplane's got an altimeter in it. I just don't know where it is. <laughs> you know, I'd have to look for it. Well, that's not very safe. But why did they do that? Well, I don't know why. It's just because a lot of our senior officers at that time had flown all the different airplanes, and they thought everybody should fly them, so they did. You know, they changed that since I was in, and, and which is for the better. That, that they're more like the Air Force and the Navy. They, they're as much safer. But anyway, uh, after I went through training, and I, I got a little bit of jet training there, I got stationed at Cherry Point. Funny story about this. I walked into the personnel officer at Cherry Point. My friend, Jack Daly, and myself walked in together. We both graduated from black school together, been in, gone through basic school and all that. We'd been in a couple of years together. And he, his father had been in the Marine Corps. I never had anybody in, so I didn't know it. But anyway, we walked up to the personnel officer, and he says, you two are going down to the transport squadron. I said, wait a minute. I'm not a transport pilot. I'm a fighter pilot. He says, get out of here. Sign it, get out of here. You're going to transports. Oh, man, I'm walking out of there, and my lips, lower lips on the ground. <laughs> Jack Daly, my friend, says, oh, don't worry, Fred. He says, in the Marine Corps, we won't be in this very long. He said, besides, transports are a lot of fun. We can do that. I said, well, yeah, but I'm a jet pilot. I'm zooming, banking around. And I said, transports are great. You know what? They were. For a brand new pilot, I went every place that you could imagine in all kinds of conditions and learned to fly instruments. And really, it saved my bacon several times because I was a very good instrument pilot in transports. When I got back into single seat and, and jets and things like that, I took those same skills back and it really saved my life because I was a good, I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you I had done so much of it that I was a good instrument pilot and that was what really helped me. All right, so I started out in transports and then got, got back into jets, went overseas. I had during the well, what kind of planes did you fly after the transport? Oh gosh, after transports, uh, let me see. I well, I flew the T twenty eight in training. Besides the uh, T thirty four and then the T twenty eight, and then I flew the Super Navy bomber. No, it was the <laughs> SNB. <laughs> SNB. SNB. It was a twin, and that was in training too. And I flew that some. We had that as a a. Uh, 
uh, trainer plane too. That was a good plane. And then uh, let me see. I I don't. I don't hold. I can't find that on the internet. How, uh, how about the uh, uh, R4D? Uh, oh, the DC3. There the DC3. you go. DC3. The, you actually flew. I, you tell us about the DC3. That's, DC3. That's good here's good air. Uh, DC3 and DC4. I flew both those airplanes. Uh, here's a DC3. That's an old Douglas Sky Raider. Tail and, dragger. And, yeah, and, and then there was a DC-4. It had four engines on it. It was the oh, next one up, up okay. uh, on that airplane. And I had a lot of fun flying that. That was a good airplane. These are all transport those, planes for the Navy. Yes, time. yes. For, for the Marine Corps. We had, we, we, Marine they were, Corps. They, they were Navy airplanes, but I flew for the Marine Corps. We had a few of them. And uh, that, that was, they were fun airplanes to fly, and I really did improve my instrument skills in those so that when I got back into the T2s and things like that, it was, uh, there, there's, yeah, okay. Uh, but anyway, I had been overseas and I'd been in a, a composite squadron overseas flying several different airplanes. I got back and I'd been in the Marine Corps then about seven years and I always wanted to be an astronaut. So I put in for the astronaut what, program. What, what year? Give some years. That, uh, okay, that, now this uh, year is about, well, I started putting in for it right after I got my wings in 58, because uh, that was a new program. You knew it was coming. Uh, Mercury 7 had just gone off, and boy, I wanted to be one of those. Matter of fact, I was at El Toro with John Glenn when don't, he got picked no, up for the, that. for the uh, Mercury program. It was kind of funny because uh, John is about, oh, I think he's 10 years, maybe nine years older than I am. And uh, we looked kind of like at one time. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'd be in the PX and, uh, you know, they'd say, hey, John, and I'd turn around and they'd say, oh, no, you're not John, because, uh, you know, they get us fixed up a little bit. I always fantasize. There he goes. He's, he looks just like you. That, that he, he uh, looks just like you. <laughs> I mean, that's not that, that, that if he had ever, you know, he ran for president. And I always fantasized that if he'd made president, you could I could be, be a stand-in. You could be a stand-in and play yeah, golf yeah, with that, him. That, 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a great guy, you know. He really is a, a hero, and and uh, it's uh, you know the story about him when he got to, he went to Pax River, and um, he was in Pax River just after we were at El Toro together, and <clears throat> they had picked a Navy commander to do a special coast-to-coast -coast fly in the F-8, the, the picture you saw here. They were going to fly from the East Coast to the West Coast. They're going to start out at Floyd Bennett Field in New York City. It's now closed, but it's right down there in New York City. They're going to fly from there to San Diego, and they were going to take off when the sun first came up at sunrise in Floyd Bennett Field and fly, and he's going to plug, I think he plugged three, or maybe he plugged four times, I forget, uh, re fuel. fuel. He's going to be in Burma the whole way, and land in San Diego and see the sunrise come up in San Diego, and make a, a record. It, was, it, it is still his record. Well, anyway, uh, John was telling the story about this, and he was a backup pilot. And this is, you know, talking about backups and goals, and he was there, and the Navy commander was going to be the one that was going to do this, the Navy commander pulled out onto the runway to take off and was sitting there just ready to hit the burner at, uh, as soon as the sun came up and he had oil pressure light come on. So he said, I got an oil pressure light, so they had to scrub him. He taxied off and it was just the time that John taxied on and hit the burner and went off and, and, and went all the way, burner all the way to uh, San Diego, except when he was re refueling, of course. And from then on, he said that started his career and he went on and went to an astronaut. And he was one of our better astronauts. I mean, they're all good, but uh, he has been one of our, our better ones and became a senator and everything else like that. He ran for president, didn't make it. But anyway, uh, great guy and a great aviator. What did you learn from that application process? Good point, sir, good point. I put in for the postgraduate school right after I got my wings because I wanted to be an astronaut. And so I got turned down. <laughs> well, that was disappointing. So I put in the next year. Now I'm going to have a little uh, discipline here and put in next year. Got turned down again, second time. I put in the third year and got turned down again. Well, I was going back on my second overseas tour 
And I told Mary, my wife, I said, well, I don't think I'll put it in. Yeah, I got to turn me down three times. And you know, I thought I was a natural for that because at that time we were sending monkeys into space and I'm kind of a little guy. <laughs> I don't look like a monkey, so I thought, well, man, I could do that, you know? But they didn't pick me. Well, she said, oh, why don't you put in one more time? Well, I was overseas and I put in. They picked me up on the fourth time. Now, I've got to tell you something about this. In the Marine Corps, they do kind of funny things. They put you into a, what's called a window. And in that window, you come up for selection for various things. I didn't know this until I got to the postgraduate school in Monterey. And the reason I went there is because at that time, they were only taken aeronautical engineers into the flight training program, uh, a space program. You had to be a, 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 I was a civil engineer. So I had to get my aeronautical engineering degree. So I put in for it, didn't get it for three times, finally got it the fourth time, found out after I got there that I didn't even get into the window until I had eight years in the Marine Corps. And then you come into a window <coughs> of selection and you can, you can be considered. My dossier was probably about that thick on the things that I put in for four years, you know. <laughs> I thought for a long time they gave it to me just because they got tired of reading my dossier. <laughs> I didn't know that the service works that way, and they, they still do. They want you to be determined. They want you to not only put in one time, they want you to put in two or three times and make sure that you're serious about this. Um, that's the way they do it, you know. So let me tell you this, if you ever want something and you get turned down for it, do not get discouraged. Keep putting in for it if that's your goal, you know. And I, I kept putting in for it. As a matter of fact, I kept putting in for it. Uh, there were 29 people in my uh, postgraduate school class, naval and marine aviators. And almost all of us put in for the astronaut program. 16 out of the 29 got picked up and were astronauts. Uh, you know, Gene Cernan and, and Ray Evans and, and Bob Obermeyer and, and all those guys. Uh, they were classmates of mine. They all, all made it. I was a little disappointed when I didn't make it. I was 45 years old and Jack Lausman was the guy down in, in he was a classmate also. Uh, he was down in uh, Houston picking the people to come. So I put in, I'm 45 years old. I call up Jack and I say, hey Jack, are you gonna pick me for an astronaut? We're good buddies, you know? He said, oh gee, Fred. He says, we're looking for 25 year old astronauts, not 45 year old astronauts. So I finally got the message and I quit putting in for it. But I told you that I thought I was a natural worker because I had all the same training. I was a test pilot by then and all that kind of stuff been through postgraduate school, and I couldn't figure out why I didn't get it. Let me tell you, I wasn't even gonna say this, but I am. When I was at postgraduate school and graduated, the Department of the Navy in Washington, a uh, uh, detailer there, called me up and said, hey, come, we need to have somebody to bring a new aircraft into the, the system. It's called the A6 Intruder. And it's a super secret G whiz aircraft with a lot of electronics on it. It's got all these kind of things that it can do. And we need a maintenance officer for it. And you've been in maintenance your whole entire career. You've got a postgraduate degree now. Will you go to the squadron and take it? And I said, throw me into that briar patch. Yes, I will. Yes, yes. And when do I have to be there? I said, well, of course you had to be there yesterday. I said, well, I'm going to graduate. You know, this was like uh, the month before I was going to graduate. And they said, well, uh, we'll let you graduate, but you gotta come right then. So I went up to the Admiral, and that was in charge of the postgraduate school, a really nice guy, and I said, Admiral, I've got this opportunity to bring a new aircraft into the system. It's a golden opportunity for me, but to get my master's degree, which you had out of there, you have to write what's called a thesis. Now, a thesis takes anywhere from three months to six months to write. It's a big document, it can go up to 150, 200 pages, and you gotta do a lot of research on it and spend a lot of time, you know, sweating energy and tears and blood and everything else to get that thing done, you know? And I, all my classmates, except me, were going to stay on after the two years and do it, finish it in three to six months, and then they were gonna to go to the fleet. But they wanted me 
right then. So I went up to him and said, Admiral, can I write my thesis while I'm in the fleet? And he said, well, that's going to be pretty hard, Cone. But he says, we'll let you do it. And he said, I'll let you do it. I'll give you five years to do it. Oh, that's easy. Easy, Admiral. I'll do it. <laughs> well, graduation came. Mary had the kids in the car and the dog and everything, gas carred up. I ran across the stage, jumped in the car, and went back to Oceana and started my new job as the maintenance officer at the brand new squadron, brand new inventory. I didn't realize that when you get a new piece of equipment in the military, that is a big job. I like it's 25 hours a day, eight days a week. And I worked my tail off doing that for a whole year. And then, you know what? They gave a war. So I went to war, 15 months of war, came back, had another year transitioning another squadron to go, and then went to war again. Another 15 months of war. Came back, all at once, my five years is up, and I hadn't finished my thesis. So, I graduated from the Naval Postgraduate School, which I was supposed to get a master's degree in, with a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering. I'd taken all the courses. <laughs> but you didn't get the master's because you didn't write the thesis. I didn't write Isn't the that thesis. that crazy? The point is here, when you start something, you finish it, okay? Now, that was my own fault. And people said, well, are you sorry that, well, yeah. You know the reason? I'm going to go back one. It knocked me out of being an astronaut. The reason being, when you get to, an astronaut, when you get to that point, you get into a situation. You're right now. You're on a pyramid, and you're down here, right here, high school. And then you're going to get into college, and then you're going to get into a master's program, or you're going to get into another program. You're going to start climbing this ladder to get up here on top, okay? And you notice that as you get up here on top, this becomes a lot <coughs> thinner up here. There's a lot fewer people up here. And when you get a lot fewer people, you get these same people that are coming in here, they got all these qualifications. You know, in my case, I was a test pilot. I had all the flight and, uh, jet hours and things like that. Uh, I had all, I've been to school, but I hadn't finished that master's degree. So when they opened up my dossier, my book back at the headquarters to look into who they're going to select for astronauts, they looked in there and they said, oh, come on, oh, wait a minute. He didn't get a master's degree. Pitch it over the side. They'll do that, doesn't make any difference what the color of your eyes is, how you part your hair, uh, how many, what you do. They are looking in everything, not only in the military, but in the civilian life too. They're looking for reasons not to select you to get up here, okay? They got so many people that are qualified and they got so much talent that they've got to find a reason to not qualify you and any little thing will toss you out. It's not that they don't like you. It's not that you couldn't qualify for the job, but you don't have what they want as far as the qualifications are concerned. Nothing personal about it. They just got to narrow down the field. Now, you're going to be in that situation one day yourself. You're going to be in a place where you're going to have to judge. And you're going to have to take people. And it's not easy, I can tell you. The colonel can tell you this, too. He's been on promotion boards, as I have, and things like that. It's really not easy. In the Marine Corps, I used to stand on a lot of enlisted permission uh, promotion boards. And we'd get down and we'd have... A bunch of Marines were all the same. They'd done all kinds of things. We'd get down and we'd pick them. Finally, on rifle scores. Who scored the best on <laughs> rifle range? You know? And, and that's dumb, but you gotta have something that you got. You can't just call because, you know, like the guy, you like the color of his eyes or part the way he parts his hair. You can't do that. You know, that's not right. But if they have done something a little bit better, even if it's just a rifle score, they'll select them. Is that right, Top? You, yes, sir. you know that, that well. So what I'm telling you is this. Do the very best you can wherever you are. You know, have your goals, yes, but you want to have a backup. Well, yeah, my goal is to get to be an astronaut. I got up to here, and I didn't make it. But, you know, I had a backup. What was the backup going to be? Well, I had... 
uh, been a maintenance officer my entire career, and I loved it. I was an uh, engineer and things like that, and it was, it was really fun to be out and work on the airplanes, and so I was doing what I liked. I was flying airplanes and things like that, so I just kept on. It was kind of a funny story because while I was in school, uh, I worked for the Forest Service uh, uh, on the summer times. Walked in. Matter of fact, I worked here in the Kayabab and Sick Grace Forces as a, as a surveyor. And <laughs> anyway, uh, I worked as a surveyor and, and it, was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So they gave me a, a rating in the Forest Service back, way back then as a GS3, which was pretty good then. And they said, well, you got a job when you get out of the service, you know, come back and work for us. And I'd been in the Marine Corps for, oh, I don't know, four or five years, and got to flying. And Mary and I, uh, both from the farm, my wife and I, we liked moving around. They moved us 24 times in 30 <laughs> years. Now, that's a little much, but that's okay with us. Anytime they say, anybody want to volunteer to go play band, we had a head, head out the door, ready to go, you know, and had a great time doing it. She was a great wife, and, and we, we really enjoyed it. But, you know, uh, the service is, is not for everybody. I realize that. But you all are getting a taste of it here and things like that. And I'm just about out of time. And I only had one question as we're going along. Um, I guess I kind of wrap it up by saying I, I flew uh, for most of the career that I had. However, in the Marine Corps, a little bit different than the Air Force. When you're in the Air Force, you uh, get to fly an awful lot. And they, like I said, the Air Force pilots, I hate to admit this, Colonel. <laughs> I hate to, but it's true. Uh, the Air Force pilots are awfully, awfully good, you know, because they keep in the, the seat and they uh, get to be very good at their job. In the Marine Corps, you move around a lot. I had a lot of ground jobs. I was uh, G3 of an infantry division uh, as a, a Zumi, as a pilot. I had a ground job, and I was a forward air controller, ground job. Uh, so you do a lot of things in the Marine Corps as good. I'll put it this way. They train you as a Marine to be an infantryman. And you are basically an infantryman no matter what you do, whether you are in tanks or artillery or airplanes or computers or whatever. You are basically an infantryman. And you are there to support that private out there on the point with a gun. And everything you do is to, to support him or her out there. Uh, so we, we train a little bit differently and have a little bit different uh, priorities than the other services do. But it, it's fun. It's, it really is fun. And I really enjoyed it. Heck, I'd still be in if they kept They kicked me out after 30 years. They said it was too ugly. I was running too many people away. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't let me stay in. Oh, well, no. That's, that's true. They, you they, have they, about they, 10 minutes, sir. Uh, they don't see many Marine uniforms. Can you tell about your uniforms, some of your decorations, or oh, war no. stories there? Uh, decoration, they, they have badges here. These are shooting badges. Mm -hmm. And every Marine is, a, is an infantryman. So we qualify every year. You have to go out and shoot the pistol, and not have to, you want to, you know, go out and shoot the pistol, shoot the, uh, the rifle, and shoot the machine gun, and everything else. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. In the wing, uh, when you're flying, you have to qualify with your airplane. And uh, that's a real syllabus, too, that you have to go through. They make you do all kinds of maneuvers, but one of the things you have to do, I was an attack pilot. Uh, your, your colonel here is a fighter pilot, and the fighter pilots are a little bit higher than the attack pilots. As a matter of fact, in, in the Marine Corps, they, they call the, the attack pilots, they attack pukes. Okay. <laughs> it's a little endearing term, you know, but really, you know, the, the, the fighter pilots are a little bit up here, uh, higher than the attack pilots. But in an attack aviation, you have to uh, be able to hit the target. Uh, and then you practice a lot on air to ground, uh, ordnance and things like that. Uh, you do have some air to air that you get to do, but very little, not as much as the fighter pilots, and you don't get as proficient in it as the fighter pilots do, but you do get very proficient in uh, your air to ground. You can do pretty good. If you practice enough, anybody can get it, you know. It's kind of hard when you start any kind of a thing to be accurate and things like that, but they have contests where they get the circular error problem, CEP they call it, and you've got to get so many targets, uh, I mean so many rounds on the target and, and things like that. But anyway, uh, you get these badges for shooting the rifle and the pistol, and you get to do those all the time. And I still like to go out and shoot. It's a lot of fun. 
Uh, the others are many, I, I've been there type of things, uh, you know, for various theaters you go into. The Marine Corps doesn't go to as many as the Air Force does, they go all over the world. And so they can get European uh, uh, medals and, and, and ribbons and things like that. Most, uh, all of mine, are uh, Southeast Asian. We weren't in Iraq and Afghanistan when I was in. Now, the Marines today have ribbons that they've been in those, and those show you various places that you've been or things that you've done. Uh, the yep. wings, of course, you get after you graduate from, from pilot school. You can get jump wings as a, a uh, uh, paratrooper, uh, you get jump wings there, and then we have uh, whizzos and, and things like that who are uh, officers that uh, do the electronic things. Uh, electronics is big. Very big. As a matter of fact, it was big even in Vietnam. Uh, now it's even bigger. Uh, they have uh, electronics officers and things like that uh, in those kinds of military occupational specialties, MOS as they call them, that uh, do all kinds of uh, fancy things with electronics. One of the things that to do, and the Colonel knows about this too, is that they have uh, these electronic people and they can go out and they can actually bend the radar beams in the enemy. And you would be going along and flying, and you'd see these uh, shells bursting on a straight line just the way you were going, but they would be over here, uh, or I don't know, they looked like they were about 50 feet away, but they weren't. Uh, they, they were about 500 feet or more, 1,000 feet, and they'd just be falling. You'd cut one way, and they'd come and set. And the electronics that they have, or these uh, officers that, that handle these things, actually bend those radar beams and keep them off of you. And you would never go into a hot target like Hanoi or Haiphong, uh, the, the cities in Vietnam that we were bombing and things like that, unless you had one of those people with you. It was sure dead. I will tell you. It was very it's, classified at the time yeah, too, but now it's, it's, yeah, it is. it's real common. I'll take you up for a story about that. Like stories, you have a, like your targets, you'll have a goal. You have a, sec a primary goal. Or started. Then you'll have a backup that you'll go to if something is wrong with the primary. Well, I can never forget one night, we, I was going on a mission over Hanoi, and Hanoi was one of the most heavily defended targets the world has ever known, even more heavily defended than Stalingrad and Leningrad in the Second World War. Uh, I had a, a friend that counted the heavy, uh, the heavier than 23 caliber uh, weapons, the 23 millimeter caliber weapons that were around Hanoi one time, and there was almost 500 of them clustered around that target. So they could send up walls of steel just about any place that you wanted to do it with. And so we'd have these uh, electronic countermeasures airplane going to protect us. And these officers I was telling about were working in these electronics could bend those beams. Well, I was going away to Hanoi to target one night, and this airplane that was, they, they were called Playboy aircraft went down, electronics. And so uh, they went back, and so I was going to go to the secondary or backup mission, which was a little bit not as, as heavily defended as the primary Hanoi mission was. And uh, I called up and asked for permission to go to the secondary mission, which was not as heavily defended. And it was like three or four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and the officer in charge came back and said, Negative, go to your primary mission. The bombardier and navigator and I looked at one another, and we, it was three o'clock in the morning, we, we turned white as a sheep. We were going into instant death. Without that electronic third engine to get those beams, we were going to die. It was certain. You have various targets that have various code names on them, that are, and they go by how heavily defended they are and how important they are. And it goes right from not so important to very, very important to right, uh, they're crossing the fence of the White House, they're, they're jumping over the fence, they're going to assault the president, you know. That, and that code name at that time was mandatory. And every once in a while you come up with one of these thoughts that's even better than you think about. And so I came back to the uh, 
man down in Saigon that was controlling the mission, probably a, a second lieutenant at three in the morning, and I said, Roger, understand this is a mandatory mission. He said, wait, what? And I could almost see him jump up out of his seat, go back <laughs> to the back where a major or lieutenant colonel was probably trying to get a few winks that was the duty officer and said, hey, this crazy Marine up there says, that, ask if this mission is a mandatory mission. I could almost hear him say, tell him no, to go to the secondary <laughs> target. Well, he came back, you know, in, in just a few seconds, but it seemed like minutes or hours. And said, all right, you're clear to the secondary target. But by this time, sweating the cockpit was up. Because <laughs> we knew we were going to die. <laughs> and he said, okay, but, oh, we're saved, you know. Boy, that was a, one of the happiest days. <laughs> happiest missions I had to go to the secondary target. Well, listen, it's almost out of time. And I've been doing all the talking. And uh, I only got to two of the things uh, that we got up here. I want to emphasize it to you again because it's the important thing, you know. You always want to have a goal. And if you can't get your goal, always have to have that. Remember when I was going to college, I, I didn't. I was going to be a farmer, then I went to college. Uh, uh, I was going to be a, a farmer and I studied engineering. I was going to be an astronaut and then I became a maintenance officer. Yeah. So if you have these, not disappointments, but if you have these things that <coughs> stop you from going running, don't even miss a lick. Just switch over and go to that backup one and go great guns. Uh, my mother had a say, saying, and, and uh, I'll just give it to you. You know, she says, do whatever you do to the very best of your ability and do it as just if you were doing it for the Lord. And I've always remembered that. And my mother told me that, to do whatever you're doing to the best of your ability and do it as if you're doing it for the Lord. And you know, that kind of keeps your goal. If you go from one goal to your backup, things like that, it, it's okay. Hey, I didn't make general. You know, I had a guy as a colonel. I had a goal one time to be a general. You know, but I didn't make general. But you know what? If I'd made general, if I would made general, I won't say it was, there was the, when I came up for it, uh, there were two people who made it, and I like to think if they made three, I would have been the third one. However, there were 43 other colonels that were in the zone, and all 43 of them the same thing. Yeah, if, you know, they made third in the bedroom. But you know what? Those two guys made it, and they were really good, but I've had a great career. I had a wonderful career, and if I had made general, I wouldn't be standing here with you right now. I'd probably be up in some high business place doing something that didn't make any difference anyway. And you know, <laughs> and here I get to talk with you all and be with you and, and answer your questions and do things and maybe incite you to do uh, something like I did. It, it's just a wonderful life. It really all right, everybody, give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Brilliant, Jay Hunt. Go to great things. Dismissed! Go, Go do! do.